Rhonda, I'm back with my second Khan Academy video. Recall that in the first one we defined the gradient of a function of two variables and the directional derivative of a function in the direction of a unit vector u. Now in this video I want to try and convince you that some of the important properties of the gradient are actually derived from features of the directional derivative. So in order to see that we have to take a side trip for a moment and recall an alternate definition of the dot product of two vectors. So that should be a straight vector. And let's let theta be the angle between those two vectors. Well the alternate definition is that the dot product of u and v is the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of the angle between them. This definition is extremely useful <clears throat> Actually, this definition is usually given in terms of coordinates, the product of the first coordinates plus the product of the second coordinates. But this is particularly useful because when two vectors are perpendicular or orthogonal, then the angle between them is 90 degrees, so the cosine is zero. So in the case of perpendicular vectors, the dot product is zero and it goes the other way. If the dot product of two vectors is zero, <clears throat> we know that they must be perpendicular. That's an extremely useful feature of the dot product. So now let's just return to the directional derivative, which is defined as a dot product, and apply that definition and see what it tells us. Well, this is the length of the gradient times the length of u times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So let's say this is u, and this is the gradient, and that's theta. Well, we know that u is a unit vector, so this is just 1. So this is actually equal to the length of the gradient vector times the cosine of the angle between u and the gradient. Now, we know something important about the cosine, Namely, it's always between 1 and minus 1. And that tells us something fairly interesting about the directional derivative. It tells us what is the largest value the directional derivative can have and what is the smallest value the directional derivative can have. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> when cos theta is 1, the directional derivative is a max because 1 is the largest value that this can have. And what is that value? It's just the value of the length of the gradient. By contrast, when cos theta is minus 1, the directional derivative is a minimum because that's the smallest. Otherwise, this is a number between minus 1 and 1. It's a minimum, and that value, this would now be minus 1, <coughs> is the negative of the length of the gradient vector. So we want to keep that in mind and look at a surface that's going to make this a little more transparent. Well, I want a surface that looks a little bit like a mountain because we're going to be doing some skiing shortly. So let's go back to R3 and let's now take a function, maybe a paraboloid. Looks like that. Let's go down here. Something like that. So now we have a function of two variables. Let's take a point down here. Let's take a point x naught, y naught, and plot that point on our surface. Okay? Now, it is a natural question to ask, in which direction should we go so that the rate of change along this curve is going to be the greatest or the least? Said another way, what are the directions of maximum descent and ascent. Okay? 
Well, we know that the direction of maximum ascent is going to be in the direction of the gradient. In other words, when u and the gradient are in the same direction. That's same, not same. The direction of maximum descent is in the direction of minus the gradient. But l let's see what that looks like in this picture. Okay, one thing that I have not told you, it's a property of the gradient vector that's extremely important, but due to budgetary constraints, we did not have time to prove this. It's we, We've actually done most of the work, but at any rate, if we slice through a surface with a plane where z is a constant, then what do we get? Well, in this case, it looks like we get a circle or an ellipse, depending on what the equation of that surface is. And it is a fact that, so this is called a level curve. And it is a fact, and an important fact, that at any point, the gradient vector is always perpendicular to level curves. So the gradient vector is perpendicular to level curves. What does that mean? Well, remember, the gradient vector is a two-dimensional vector, not a three-dimensional vector. So it means that once we have this curve, there's kind of a tangent line to that curve. And perpendicular to that, in one of those two directions, will be the gradient vector. Now, I drew it so it kind of looks like it's pointing upwards, but it's down here. We could draw it in the xy plane. So let's think about this in terms of doing some skiing. Now, I have a family friend, Katya. She is in college now, but I have discuss mathematics with Katya since she was in eighth grade and she's a very bright young woman. Let's see Katya. There she is. She's also quite fashionable so we'll give her some ski gear. She has lived all over the world and she has in particular skied the Matterhorn. Let's make her skis vectors. Why not give her some poles. Now, Katya has skied the Matterhorn, which is in the Alps. It's a mountain between Switzerland and Italy, and it looks a little bit like that. So let's assume that Katya is at this point on the surface of the Matterhorn. Now, because I care about her safety and well-being, when Katya decides to ski downhill, I would, of course, hope that she does what most reasonably cautious skiers would do, and that is zigzag down the hill or down the mountain. However, let's assume that for a moment, Katya wants to go down that hill and experience the maximum rate of descent. So let's say she wants to go in the direction that will give her the maximum rate of descent. Well, we know that that is minus the direction of the gradient. Now in this case, because of what we said about gradients being perpendicular to level curves, the gradient is actually going to be this vector pointing inward. Why is that? Because when we take this vector and plot the corresponding points along the surface, we get a curve. And so it's that curve that has the maximum rate of change in that direction. What if we go, so this in fact is the gradient vector. What if we go in this direction minus the gradient vector? Well, what does that mean? It means we take these points and we plot them on the surface. And if Katya skis this way, she will enjoy the maximum rate of descent down the Matterhorn. Now, there's something slightly subtle here. Because she's going up or down the hill, down probably, it feels like maybe the vector should point down like this or something like that. But remember, the gradients, it doesn't because if she went in that direction, she would go into the ground. If she went in this, in a direction like this, she would fly off into space, which we certainly don't want to happen.
to Katya. But the vector that we're interested in, the gradient, is a two-dimensional vector. So all it means is that it creates a curve along the surface, and it's that curve that will have the maximum or minimum rate of change. Now this property of the gradient is extremely important. If you've ever seen water trickling down a mountainside from a stream, perhaps, it always takes the path of maximum descent. That means that at any given point, the water will travel in the direction of the gradient. And many of the fundamental applications of the gradient depend on those properties. So I hope that I have shown you in this second video, at least to some extent, that the directional derivative really does contribute to some of the success that the gradient enjoys. I don't really have time to tell you more. There is always more, but that can be for another time. Thank you so much for your attention.